Buonasera. Good evening and welcome to you all here at this meeting entitled This is the way our lives changed. Justice beyond punishment. What is about to begin now is a meeting to be handled with care. We have to go into details in the happenings that occurred very carefully and we have to be able to listen carefully. To use the words of the protagonists of this meeting, we shall go beyond the willingness to judge and have everything clear since from the very start. We have to be willing to be involved, even though it's not necessary to be convinced about their experience. These quotations have been drawn by a beautiful book that is entitled The Book of Meeting, Il Libro dell'Incontro. This approach towards silence and tact follows by the experience of what we are about to listen. We are about to listen the results of an experience that spread along seven years of meetings among some victims and their families and some of the responsible of the armed uh, battle that occurred over the last century in Italy. It's a very intimate question for those who are directly involved and uh, here you have some of the protagonists and uh, very thorny from the political point of view because it's one of the most struggled upon pages of Italian history and consent is yet to be found on that historical period. We will talk about wounds and um, very difficult battles, uh, very difficult to overcome, battles that are very difficult to overcome. The problems that we're going to deal with are very delicate, therefore we have to be very respectful during today's meeting. Let's be clear. What we are about to listen to, it's not a political or an historical analysis of the lead, the years of lead. Such protagonists are here because they've been witnessing a history within Italian history, a history that is made of human beings that allow themselves to participate in a new life. They said that the focus of their attention is uh, human beings and uh, human pathways, narrations and experiences, feelings that draw their strength and credibility simply from the fact that they have been narrated. And they've been narrated always with uh, another part listening to them. It's about reconstructing relationships between uh, those who perpetrated violence and their victims. We're going to hear personal experiences, yet not simply personal. They've been developing in uh, a total um, uh, in a totally reserved environment, yet the cultural drawbacks make sure that a cultural change is happening. That's why I would like to thank them for their courage and willingness to be here at this meeting. The meeting wants that this richness of uh, such an experience can lead to benefits and advantages for everybody. So let's be careful about adjectives. Those experiences are personal, 
confidential but not private. At the same time, they are public, yet they're not institutional nor about policies. Their experience was outside any type of mandate or personal acknowledgement. So what was the trigger of such an experience? First of all, the personal need of each and every one of them to start once again a new pathway. And I'm talking about culprits and victims at the same time. Secondly, an experience that inspired them and took place in South Africa. That was the experience for the, from the Commission of Truth and Reconciliation uh, over the period of apartheid under the Desmond Tutu presidency. In the words of Adolfo Ceretti that we will hear later, we can read the following sentences. We agreed to host some of the victims and familiars and wanted to welcome them so that their memory could not be forgotten in the light of looking forward to finding a truth in order to go beyond the sufferings that have been mm, perpetrated. Therefore, the South African experience uh, helped us to uh, go towards the pathway that we've chosen. Facts are not deniable, yet we can open up a new future." End of quotation. Since from the very pages of the book, we are struck by the recurrent presence of two semantic groups of words. The first ones, characterized by un-prefix uh, unreduced, unreducible, unjust. Many words that call upon removal, the removal of a condemnation to uh, always be influenced in the present from past events. The second group, uh, featured by the prefix re. Restart, recognize, repair, justice in this case, remember, restore, replace, and so on. These words remind us of the opportunity of having a new perspective, yet the perspective remaining the same. All of this denial, such as the prefix in, reminds us, opened up to a rebirth, and a sudden rebirth. Claudia Mazzucato could not be here. She is the one of the author of this book, and we would like to thank her for her hard work. She remembers us of a famous sentence by Eugenio Montale, who said that one unforeseen event, it's our only hope. Just a few more remarks that I would like to um, head to young generations here among the audience. I would like to remind you about the historical context of the year of Leeds, because how our history books do not talk about that. The 70s and 80s were highly conflictive from a social point of view. Some conflicts also happened over the previous years, but on the 12th of December 1969, a leap in violence took place and wanted to transform completely the status quo. Inside uh, Banca Nazionale dell'Agricoltura, in the very heart of Milan, Fontana Square, just beyond Duomo, a bomb exploded provoking 17 wounded 
and uh, many diseased people. From then onwards, some people believed that um, the armed war was a possible pathway. Five bombs were founded in Milan that day, but just the one in the bank exploded. From that moment onwards, a tension strategy started that worsened a lot over the 70s, and the number of victims was very high. Victims were chosen for the role they had, but the feeling of uncertainty and fear belonged to every citizen. The 70s and 80s were defined as the years of murders, massacres and civil destruction. But why was that violence striking over social lives? Please pay attention, and I'm talking to you, young generations. It was not only about destructive energies. It was a violence surging from a political battle that wanted to achieve a more just and even society that at a certain point believed that the armed clash was useful. Violence was considered as a legitimate tool in order to achieve political targets, and who were those involved. The book collects many testimonies that at times do not have a signature. The quotation is the following. I was following the high school Liceo Berche in Milan, the Statale, the public university in Milan, and many of my classmates decided to start a violent battle. I didn't join, yet I shared many ideals and values that each and every one of us could interpret in different ways over those years. So at times, very often, the people involved was very, very young, 20 to 22 years. They were not marginalized nor um, people that were staying on uh, the borders of societies. These young people lived their ideals, their political ideas, up until the point that at some certain point they adopted violence. So those were the people involved. And uh, public people were struck by such violence. Professors at the university, police forces, um, managers of companies and institutional um, representatives. The goal, and this is a quotation, the goal was to destroy the state machine and therefore power. The need back then was to strike power where it was more efficient, therefore the function was struck. The best ones were our target. So to um, uh, eliminate those that were um, in the most powerful places. From 16th of March till 9th, 9th of May 1978, we witnessed the kidnapping and killing of Aldo Moro, one of the highest protagonists of Italian politics, and our president Mattarella reminded us of that. He was a member of the Constituent Assembly, Ministry of our Council and Ministry of uh, Instruction, also belonging to the party of the Christian Democrats and a man that had an extraordinary uh, moral value. Moro was the promoter of a line that could allow the Christian Democrats and the right wing part, the left wing party to cooperate together. He pronounced a crucial speech in order to achieve 
the birth of a new government that featured a new cooperation among the left wing and the right wing of the parliament. On the 9th of Mar May, after 55 days of imprisonment by the Red Brigades, he was killed. He was 61 years old. That event struck at the heart of the state, but Agnese Moro, the daughter of Aldo Moro, will tell us more about that. That story was an unthinkable event in our history. With the killing of Aldo Moro, institutions were struck, as well as common daily life of people and social life of people. Social battle, therefore, became um, ravaging. In the light of this historical moment, you can perfectly understand how much relevance has today's meeting. More voices are here amongst the audience, and I would like to thank them. But here, next to me, sits Agnese Moro sociologist and psychologist, a member of ASDO, an assembly of women for development and against social exclusion. She's working on uh, the Academy on Historical Studies on Aldo Moro, and of course, she's the daughter of Aldo Moro. Maria Grazia Grena is working in the field of social assistance and the rights of convicted people in the association Los Carcere. She works with uh, imprisoned people. And as she says, she went through the whole life of the antagonism movement of Lotta Operaia, living as a, um, an illegal person uh, with an illegal life for many years, and she fought throughout her life. And then we have Adolfo Ceretti, a criminologist at the University in Milan, Bicocca, a dear friend of mine. He is a scientific coordinator in the um, criminal office in Milan. He is not only studying criminal phenomena, but also working in direct contact with those people involved with criminality, with a face-to-face -face approach. His role in this event is uh, uh, the role of a witness together with uh, Mazzucato and Bertagna, who are not here, yet they, we, we all feel their presence here. They said, we are witnesses, we are not neutral observers. We've been those in the middle, third parties, those that broke rivalries, thus allowing a third possibility, a different possibility. Let's hear about their job. Thank you. You played a decisive role even with the microphone. I am really glad to be here to sit at this table. And I sit next to three women, Agnese Grazia and Marta, who are very different one from the other, but they are really unequaled women. Women that I love uh, for what they are, for what they think, for how they think of it, and how 
in different moments of life, they helped me facing uh, difficulties. And now I quote, you wanted to bring life, you brought death. You wanted to defend life's dignity and you ended up with uh, supporting death. You wanted to avoid miserable uh, feelings. But what you have to face is not just the fact that you betrayed life, but most of all that you betrayed yourself. End of quotation. It's not uh, someone who is imitating St. Paul, but it's a former component of the Red Brigade talking about the meetings that we started in 2009 and coordinated and mediated with uh, Guido Bertagna and Claudia Mazzucato. I not going to get into the details uh, about the history of those years because Marta has already mentioned them. In Italy, those years were particularly cruel and 428 people between 1969 and the mid-80s were killed. There were 2,000 people wounded and many of them had permanent problems and uh, 146 uh, attacks. So at that time there were tragedies, attacks, perpetrated by those who wanted to wanted their ideas to dominate even through the use of violence and generally we talk about political violence after that there were years of trials of detentions for and so prisons for uh, uh, those who perpetrated that violence so going back to the quotation said that someone ended up in supporting death, in offending life. And here we see how the inner experience of people who killed people is difficult. Several times in my life, I've wondered what were the reasons that made me study and work on these topics. And I often say that the strongest interest came from the need to understand, to understand how A criminal feels something that is unbearable and tries to understand the point of view of the victims. And it is connected to a profound sense of injustice that we tend to have when there are victims Things that change ourselves and the others, our uh, affections. So the evil has been encountered by the victim and so it will be elaborated. But it was also encountered by the criminal who in turn elaborated it. This evil made us more vulnerable. The first homicide and the first arrival of the evil, as you all know, according to the Bible, comes from a rage. A rage that 
was repressed. And it's the case of Cain that didn't respect what God told him. And this was also mentioned by Bretagna in one of his papers. God talked to Cain and advised to be the master of his feelings, but Cain didn't listen to it. He didn't accept the invitation of God. So the rage became hatred, and hatred can do even more than rage, and so Cain uh, killed Abel. But what does this tell us? It is clear that what Cain did, Cain did, is not just to um, not respect the rules, but it's being ready, ready to deal with the obscure uh, side of life. As Borgman said, it's a hard coexistence with brothers that have suspects. Even if um, we can control our impulses, Cain doesn't do it. This is why I quoted this episode because it explains better than anything else how the good and the evil play a role in the life of every man but even the mix between the two things the mix Several people, for example, do not completely understand because they cannot, they are not aware of the complexity that is behind it. And I'm talking about mediators or experts in justice, which is instead very important. So violence, even the very initial violence, and has a history, and it is something connected to the inner feelings of a person. For several years, we have analyzed several cases and we understood that those who commit uh, serious crimes have a story and this story must be listened to and understood. So. It could happen that violence is also the result of a relationship which is which has become negative and unbearable. So and the evil is not just an explosion, something that arrives all of a sudden, but after a sort of conversation that is mainly an inner conversation that can be confused and not easy to understand, as for Cain, who was not in contact with the most important interlocutor anymore. As a criminologist and mediator, in the last 20 years of my life, I've mainly listened to the victims of violent crimes and they talked to me about what they really felt inside. And what they thought about what they went through or, for example, in the case of criminals, 
the violence that they perpetrated. This is fundamental to understand the needs, the expectations of those people. It's a way for every person to make his or her story understood and the society as well. So that this sort of soliloquy of these people makes us understand what is at the basis of violence. So what a person thinks as he or she is committing something violent. So it's necessary to understand each individual, each and every individual and their experiences. In my opinion, as in the opinion of my colleagues, the basis of justice is this. Justice must listen to the experiences of everyone. Inside history, the stories of armed struggles, victims and perpetrators um, makes us understand some very important points for the civil uh, for the existence of the civil society. For very difficult reasons, over the decades, the protagonists of this tragic event had just some occasions to meet or Maybe they didn't even have the chance. And so, their soliloquies did not go out especially when they talked about the tragedy of armed struggle. Every soliloquy was like imprisoned and closed in a space that was becoming claustrophobic. It was the body of the person who was responsible for the armed stru struggle or the, vits the victim. The lack of a chance to listen to the various voices that were the protagonists of those years did not enhance the possibilities of contact between the different parties. Then things have changed. Uh, Bretagna, Mazzucato and I worked for this meeting, for this encounter, that at some point became possible and we acted as a mediator. Some of the protagonists uh, were Women, men and women that were very different one from the other, victims and people responsible for the armed struggle. But then there were also people that represented the civil society, young people or less young people, some of them are here today, and they helped us understand what was the effect of being witnesses to those encounters between those people? There were artists, writers such as Luca Doninelli, scholars, researchers that worked with, with us in order to guarantee what we were doing. We were not tourists in the years of Leeds, as someone said. 
in our book we said that we didn't look for this type of experience, but the experience, this experience arrived. And this is how we decided to find new meanings for the word justice. We took the first steps with some conferences at Centro San Fedele in Milan at the beginning of 2000. And at that time, we started to know by chance, or because they were interested in the events, people that in the 70s and 80s were either on one side or on the other of the barricade. And that was an occasion to get closer to us in a familiar atmosphere with where Guido Bertagna was acted uh, as a central uh, protagonist from the very beginning. These people didn't want to forget those years and they wanted to rethink them, talking about things that generally, uh, ordinary life, justice, mass media, TV, politics, do not um, consider. That's where the idea of a document written in 2007 came from. Um, the title talked about a shared space to share memories. So, in the course of time, we understood that it is impossible to create a device to do this because memories cannot really be shared. The memory of Agnese cannot be shared with the memory of Grazia. But the two memories can be considered together And there are two types of memories, a good memory and a bad memory, and maybe the two can pull and merge, maybe making the good memory prevail over the bad one. We promoted a completely different approach, that is the possibility uh, and I think of Winnicott, uh, an important psychoanalyst. Well, we should think of languages and voices, different voices that are important, where each experience has an importance and is not censored, but listened to. Talking about uh, the experiences of others and um, where we acted as mediators, we had to make something heard and this something could not even be said in the past. It was about creating a protective space where their personal narration occurred. We, as mediators, selected some topics and each responsible of armed struggle and each familiar or victim had the chance more than once to tell about his or her personal experience, including those that came into our group after it started its activities. Daughters and 
sons of the responsible of armed struggle were also involved and they can be considered victims as well. Women and men that the ordinary justice is ignoring, yet they play an important role. We witnessed a very special dialogue. Those who were talking inside our group could do that in the face of somebody else that was the victim or the responsible of an action of armed struggle. So exchanging sights and faces very probably can be said as the beginning of justice. Each responsible of armed struggle and each victim had somebody else witnessing the meeting and going beyond their limited way of considering reality. Our challenge it was that we wanted to bring something external in this dialogue. As Pope Francis said, and I quote, at the beginning of dialogue you have an encounter. From that encounter you start knowing the other human being. If we consider that we all belong to human nature, we can go beyond prejudice and false stances, thus uh, achieving a new reality, end of quoting. So belonging to human nature. Over those years, those who perpetrated those crimes uh, tried to dehumanize other human beings in order to act and attack somebody else's body. Well, they actually um, attacked the role of that person. These criminals were going beyond the person itself. What we wanted to do was to give them back their humanity. Well, we didn't do that. They did them themselves. Each and every one of us had the chance to raise their sight after such a hard work. So the criminal had to listen to the violated person and there was an exchange of dignity. For victim, this passage is fundamental if they want to get healed. So I mentioned uh, justice earlier. We have some models that include mediations. When does mediation occur? What methods did we use? And I conclude. We've been working with an idea in our mind. There is a mediation between a guilty person and his or her victim when we can make reference to a time and space when there is also a third party meeting one or more individuals and helping them understanding the engine, the spark of the struggle. These people had a huge struggle that could not be fixed and that's because their language was completely set apart to create bridges among those worlds what was our task. One last quotation that will let you understand that we were not good for the sake of it. We were not looking for hugs and love. At times I heard screams. I saw desperation, cries, and then sudden laughs, hugs, kisses, promises, and once again, struggles 
low sides, ups and downs, a struggle that led to an encounter. This quotation belonging to somebody that wrote in this book and did not provide his name gives you an idea of what we managed to do. Start of quotation. We're not eliminating differences. The fact that we met does not cancel differences. We just broke cages. Cages that wanted us to stop in a place. We created our own place, respecting pain. And that's because his or her pain, it's not my pain. And I want that to be clear and I want them to know. Let's try to find medications together and bombs for our wounds that will stay there forever. Thank you. Thank you, Adolfo. With such an exquisite speech, he explained us the activity that has been carried out. Such soliloquies become dialogues and more speakers can add up, more important speakers can add. Don Giussani used more familiar words to us. He said, the, the, myself starts from an encounter. Let's hear what does this renaissance mean. First of all, thank you for inviting me here and for focusing on uh, such a dear experience to us. A little experience, though. You've reminded the history of uh, my father. Maybe young generations didn't know that. You might understand that, well, back then I was 25 years old and the aftermath of that event was full of pain, desperation, hatred and absence, a heavy absence. An absence le leading to uh, sufferings. And at the same time, I wanted to have and achieve justice for myself and for that person that didn't deserve to end up like that. This willingness to have justice, well, nobody knows really what's about. We all know when this justice is lacking, And this desire is a vital and strong desire. Actually, what you're being offered is civil and criminal justice. So trials, uh, prisons. Of course, these things are important. And it's important that a wrong behavior is acknowledged as such. In the history of my father, there are many numerous uneven and bad behaviors that were not detected. And criminal justice did not detect it that. But it's important we state our opinion on a specific behavior. Many damages I suffered and I struggled with the past, a past that is always emerging 
events and things come to my mind and uh, one hope that justice can help you yet justice cannot help you because it doesn't provide you with the thing that you need the most something that you would like to do you need to do but something that you can't do that is to ask questions to argue to ask how was it possible that you did something like that to my father? How was it possible that you woke up one morning planning to kill somebody? How could you? You can't really ask those questions because you don't have anyone in front of you. But there's another deeper reason if you want to ask those questions you have to have in front of you people whereas what violence causes and that's the most sad and ugly thing about violence is to transform people into things it's not important if the person that was killed had a specific role, was an enemy or was a thing. It wasn't important if the person that caused that violence was a culprit, a guilty person, the bearer of evil. It's your enemy, it becomes your enemy. at that point no dialogue is possible things are standing still if we want to say those words allowing us to open up a road that has been filled with obstacles with a unilateral act we need to come back and being human beings victims are not things and then at the end you are happy with being a thing yet your human being is hurt by that how can you destroy those cages how can you make sure that those people have back their expectations, lives and experiences? Well, I believe that those encounters allowed to create a place where we and them could be human beings one more time. We were no longer victims, guilty people, pieces of flesh in the abattoir. How was that possible? How was it possible to be back in our human beings features? Adolfo? has talked about that they gave us trust reliability we they gave us the possibility not to be alone along this pathway it was like taming us teaching us to love one another Guido often talks about proximity that's how they behaved as you all know victims believe that they're not considered by anyone this country 
does not like us. But this is partially incorrect. They helped us, and I believe that Well, we answered yes. Let's do this crazy thing. When Guido asked me to belong to this encounter, he, I said, no, I don't know you, I don't want to join. It's a very unpleasant situation. You have to change your whole life and create a mess. Not anybody is not anybody is willing to open up a dialogue. Families are not always willing to open up this dialogue. So this reliability, I had trust in them that they didn't leave me alone. I was not going to be alone. This group made of young people and the elderly, these third parties and professionals that devoted one week in the year to cook for us, those professional cooks that uh, in the mountains uh, provided us with food, they all welcomed us, but us and them were struggling in our solitude. We are a kind of institution, a positive or negative institution. On the contrary, they only welcome, welcomed us as people. They tackled the situation and witnessed our cries, our hugs and so on. So I trusted them and I believe that that encounter was astonishing. Well, first of all, I thought Red Brigade uh, people were monsters, and in my mind, those people still were monsters. Yet I describe, I, I discovered that those people were similar to me. As a human being, I mean, they were full of humanity. I met Franco Bonisoli, he came to visit me, and I was struck by the fact that he told me about his personal history, and he said that when he was imprisoned, he found the time to visit his son's professors. According to my personal experience, it's very rare to have parents visiting uh, their children's professors, so I was shocked by this man that was imprisoned and still found the time to visit his son's professors. I discovered pain. We, as victims, believe that we are the only one bearing our pain. That's not correct. I met this man with white hair and he, we shook our hands and he said, hello, my name is um, this and that and I killed this and that. And he wanted to state out loud that he had been a killer and I was shocked by this. I was also amazed by the desire they had in helping us facing many struggles and difficulties. I was happy to hear that their lives have developed in a good way. There are people doing good things and these things clash with the idea you usually have. So as soon as 
we turn into people, we can exchange harsh sentences and words of every different kind. We can dialogue. We might cause pain while saying something and they might cause pain in ourselves while we're listening. Thousands of times I just said, well, I, I want to give up, I, I don't want to listen anymore. Yet, at the end of the day, you listen to those people and accept them because these people have had difficult, painful situations, strange and absurd situations, yet they are people, they are human beings. And while you leave the status of thing to become a person, you free yourself from the past. Because that past that took your life can be given a specific place. That past caused wounds that will never ever heal. I cannot even mention some of those things, yet they are belonging to the past. And this is not something unimportant. Apart from rhetoric, well, at times we, we quarrel, we argue, yet we experienced a rebirth together. This possibility of coming to life again together, being live human beings and expressing what we hold in our hearts, it's a piece of justice the justice we're looking for and we're looking forward to finding this justice. Thank you. Great humanity and authenticity was expressed, and this applause confirm that it is so authentic. And this is one of the most convincing things in the experiences that we are listening to, and I would like to underline a couple of things that were said. Third, first is this rebirth, uh, becoming people again, human beings. And the other is the issue of time, this thing for the experience the difference between past and future. Agnese said, the past is finished and we must find a place where to hold this past. So a past that should not be cancelled or eliminated. There are people who, for example, want to understand clearly what happened in the 1970s, in those 55 days of the kidnapping of my father, for example, because otherwise I cannot understand those masters. But at some point that past uh, found its place again. Now, the floor to Maria Grazia. 
Good evening. When I was invited to join the group, to be honest, well, I was wrong, but I was convinced that I had found a place for that past. Uh, I wasn't in prison anymore. I went through rehabilitation. I found my husband that I had left uh, before the armed struggle. And I also had a son that was precious to me. And when I was invited to join the group, well, I was somehow following Claudia Mazzucato because uh, I heard her talking uh, about justice and listening to her, I was really impressed because that was the kind of justice that I was looking for. And so when I was invited, I didn't react in a very good way because I said, no, I had already done what I had to do. I didn't want to start again because uh, I went under trials. I did everything and in my life, I also tried to do something that could be useful for other people. Given the others something that I was given, so I decided to work for prisoners, offering them something I was given when I was in prison, meeting people from the civil society. So, I, in 2010, I didn't want to start back my punishment because it ended in the 1990 and in 1991 I had a son, so, so I didn't want to start again, but I realized, well, I asked who was in this group because I was curious about that, and I realized that actually it was not the past because I had never met a person that was a victim that suffered for the violence that we perpetrated. In my mind, maybe they weren't people yet, they weren't real people or human beings yet. I reflected for long, but since I didn't take part in very cruel uh, violences, I, maybe I didn't consider those people as victims. When I finally decided to, 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 play, to, take, to take part sorry, in the group, the people who suffered for the violence we perpetrated in those years made me understand that I hadn't come to terms with my past yet. And I had missed the chance to meet uh, great human beings. One is here next to me, other people are in the audience. So even the difficulty in going through those years, in recalling those years, had made sense. After the first years in prison, where we had to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves. 
because we had been dehumanized as well. It was difficult to see and recall clearly what you did in the past and what suffering you caused. You caused. We really met and got to know, we really met again during the trials when there were judges that encouraged the dialogue between us to understand how it was possible, how it had been possible at that time To start, to start from a great desire of social justice and arrive to an even bigger injustice. What had to be a means became a purpose and when we had perpetrated violence. We renounced to the human beings that came before us. It wasn't easy to become aware of this, but it is also very important to join the th two things where we started from and where we arrived. Because, as Adolfo said before, we wanted life, but actually we created death. But we wanted life. So, finding the reasons that moved us to action was extremely important. in order to find new reasons to go on living. So, the group somehow re-awoke what I had thought during the years of prison, because We weren't well aware of the atrocities that we had committed, but we had to try and not lose ourselves. So what we did during the years of imprisonment was aimed to find the humanity that we had lost. Being involved in a group meant something extremely important. Because it's true, I had somehow reconstructed my private and public life, but I couldn't talk about those years, both for a sort of censoring but also because it wasn't possible anymore. Yet those years and all the pain and suffering that provoked were important years. There were not just sufferings because actually several rights were obtained uh, thanks to the struggles of those years. However, at some point I got lost because that struggle wasn't listened anymore and getting into this group was a way to find 
a chance to be listened again. The first thing we were asked was to tell who we were and what we did. And when I told this, I really encountered the desperate voice and scream of people who asked us why, but I had no answers to those questions. Maybe I would have given banal answers. The only thing I could do was to accept that scream, that cry, and go back into the deepness of a human soul, trying to find the forces that could encourage us to continue. Well, not immediately, because when you are reminded what you did, of what you did, and you are judged uh, negatively, it's not easy. It's, it was something very harsh for me, and I was not really, I could not really decide if I liked it or not, if I wanted to stay in the group of, of, or not. It was like a pendulum, going from the positive, the good and the bad. And for sure, I was still looking for the reasons that uh, were at the basis of my decision when I was 23 years old. So today I try to accept, not forgetting what I was, when Agnese says, there is a too, too wide gap between us. However, in those years I was able to become the person I am today. And I think that going through uh, suffering, causing, unfortunately, suffering, gave me the opportunity to dig and find a deep humanity that maybe I didn't experience before. I made considerable mistakes, but in, I was somehow having the chance to rediscover myself. And thanks to this, through my experience, become useful for somebody else. And I think I should stop here. One more sentence on behalf of Maria Grazia, a gift for us. During our pr pathway, we had the chance to watch a video created by Daminim, a woman, an Israeli mother that witnessed the assassination of his of her son 
by the hands of Palestinians. Her son didn't want to be inside the cage of victims. He was looking forward to finding freedom and he and she she went so, sorry she went to South Africa and met Desmond Tutu in order to find that experience and find the strength of creating something similar in her country. Desmond Tutu was asked, is it possible to change a human being? And Desmond Tutu said, whatever was done in Africa, it was done to create a change. The trust in the possibility of a change cannot be lost. But after saying that, Desmond Tutu burst into an endless tear. So we all asked ourselves, is it really possible to change? I didn't find an answer to this question. I don't know if I changed throughout this pathway. I achieved great levels of awareness. I managed to find a position from which I can see things in a different way. At the same time, I found once more that motivation and passion that moved me when at 20 years old I destroyed my lives and the others lives. Two times Adolfo Ceretti talked about listening to something that cannot be said. Here we heard something that could not be said and I would truly like to thank Agnese and Maria Grazia for being here and telling us for one more time such deep wound and the intensity of their words communicated their feelings. We cannot give for granted that a person accept to go through such deep pain again and again. It's not the pain of victims only, it's also the pain of those who caused so much pain. I would just like to underline three aspects. The way in which we heard such narration says that we don't have to idealize anything. We have witnessed an extraordinary event about an extraordinary experience. But these women don't want to idealize that. Protagonists have spoken with such a modest attitude and the book highlights very often and with different ways that this attempt was kind of ironic. It was a pendulum going, swinging from one side to the other. Many steps are taken, yet very often one step forward is also accompanied by two step backwards. This change has not been accomplished yet. No finish line has been achieved. It's a hard adventure based on 
frailty, human frailty. They talk about a beautiful pain, a beautiful experience that is an extraordinary thing. We don't have to idealize, we have to look at that in the deepness of such humanity. This is the most convincing aspect. The second aspect I would like to highlight is the following. About a dozens of a dozen of people were involved in this experience. This event had an enormous consequence. Agnese and Maria Grazia both said we were looking for justice. The fact that a victim of a bloodshed is looking for a justice is normal. On the contrary, a person that belonged to that group that caused violence is expressing the same dissatisfaction towards traditional justice. And the willingness to go beyond is something we don't have to give for granted. This basic need of insatiable justice was the engine that moved such different people with such different experiences. Agnese and Grazia, they embody people that could also could not come here. But most of all, and our Brazilian friends with their extraordinary exhibition on APAC, and that was visited by our guests, inspire us towards new conceptions of justice. So we have to immediately detect wrong behaviors, but we have to go beyond. These conceptions of justice have been experienced in many places throughout the world and are being developed in the Italian doctrine. Mazzucato is one of the um, um, proposers of this repairing justice beyond pain. I would like to point out many more aspects of such justice, but the time we are given has come to an end. There are common pillars here. It's the possibility, the certainty. We are sure of the fact that nobody can be not saved. Javert, inside Dumas' novel, said, uh, one like you will never change. But we want to be inspired by Paul Ricoeur saying that you are more worth than your actions. That is to say, each person is bigger than their mistakes. So the crime stays outside. We want to talk about the human being. One last remark. The question is, criminal justice only has to do with those that committed a crime? Well, struggles and conflicts are all around us. I believe that each and every one of us in our own soliloquies can think about quarrels that surge in our family lives. For example, brothers and sisters might argue. So we have struggle within the family, inside the workplace, inside the social life. Pictures and newspapers told us about terrible events. Those pictures were harsh. Violence was irrational. I don't 
want to compare violence. There are different reasons and different specific uh, meanings. The cultural power of what we heard is not only given the possibility to judges and the law to rethink about what happened, it also offers to our personal experiences the picture and the certainty of an available pathway. As they themselves admit, this pathway allows them to look at them as us. It's a frail pathway. It's a very real pathway, as Pope Francis said. So I would like to thank them one more time and uh, urge you to think about justice and what we consider as justice. Thank you.